This is In Sickness and in Health. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. In this episode, we're going to talk about topics that some parents may find unsuitable for young children. Parental discretion is advised. In March, Netflix released a new series. Hey, it's Hannah. Hannah Baker. Holy shit. In a matter of days, the show was all over the news and social media. Settle in, because I'm about to tell you the story of my life. More specifically, why my life ended. A high school student commits suicide, and her downward spiral is doled out in cassette tapes. And if you're listening to this tape, you're one of the reasons why. 13 Reasons Why is a no-holds-barred version of the after-school special. It's based on a book that came out 10 years ago, but the show is what stirred real controversy. Hannah Baker commits suicide in a scene that makes a very graphic appearance in the show itself, but not before preparing a detailed narrative describing the sequence of traumatic events leading her to that point and distributing tapes of that story to the people she blames for her choice. On this episode of In Sickness and in Health, we're going to dig into a very public dimension to the mental health conversation, the world of youth pop culture. Young adult depression, social stress, suicidality, it's been fodder for writers and directors for a long time. Teen dramas are chock full of struggling kids acting out, breaking down, stewing in teen angst. Teens may see a lot of themselves in these stories, and that often makes for high ratings. But is this kind of art responsible? And does it have an obligation to be? Thirteen Reasons Why takes on some of the toughest teen issues, bullying, sexual shaming, rape, alcohol, drugs, and mental health. It's polarized the conversation around suicide and raised questions about whether the show's place in that conversation is a healthy one. The show was was meant as a tale to portray the, the worst things that could possibly happen under almost every circumstance. And they succeeded in doing that. Uh, they really believed that the whole thing was and intended the whole thing to be a cautionary tale. Victor Schwartz is the chief medical officer for the Jed Foundation. It's an organization we've talked about on the show before, one whose mission is to protect the emotional and mental well-being of young people and to prevent suicide. And I think for a lot of the viewers of it, that may very well work. Uh, but unfortunately, again, there are some vulnerable uh, young people who may or may not get that message. And, and if they don't get the message, it leaves them with a, a you know, feeling that the world is pretty bleak. Victor has been playing a major role in the media conversation about this show because he knows messaging can have a major impact on the way young people think and act. Yeah, and and that's you know part of the concern is that there are um, many young kids out there who, I think, will see uh, themselves in Hannah's experience and in, in the experiences of many of the other characters and. This is part of the concern around contagion where, uh, you know, the extent to which a kid will kind of read themselves, will identify with uh, a character like Hannah, who's, you know, very appealing in a lot of ways as a character, um, actually sort of raises some risk of potential contagion. The loudest backlash against 13 Reasons Why has been just this, that the show might cause a kid on the edge to take a step too far. The series is engrossing, it's entertaining, and the main character is sympathetic. But the show is also a virtual memorial to Hannah Baker's fictional death, and a revenge fantasy in which she finally receives everything she wanted, understanding, remorse, friendship, and love after her death. There are so many instances in the show where she misses an opportunity to get help, even when she asks for it. So there is some concern, Victor says, that a minority of viewers might conclude all adults are useless in a desperate situation, even though that doesn't reflect the real world. Do 
things like this happen sometimes? Sure. But, uh, you know, we have good data out there that people who seek help uh, lower their risk of bad outcomes and of suicide, that, you know, the, the vast majority of interactions with school counselors and, and, you know, clinicians in clinic and private settings are actually helpful to people uh, and lower their risk of self-harm and suicide. In the three weeks following the release of 13 Reasons Why, Google searches about suicide spiked with between a million and a million and a half more such searches than usual. While some were looking for suicide hotlines and prevention resources, there were also a lot more searches about how to commit suicide and how to kill yourself. Like many other mental health experts, Victor has heard of suicide attempts among kids emulating what they saw in the show. Could the show's creators have done more to mitigate the risk? Did they need to be so graphic in their depiction of Hannah's suicide? Could they have done more to emphasize the need to seek help and tell young people how and where to get it? In Hollywood, sequels and copycats are all too common. If films and shows about superheroes or zombies sell, we'll see more of them. And if suicide, eating disorders, and school shootings sell, we'll see more such productions too. But at what cost? Victor and I talked a lot about the controversy surrounding the show. For emotionally vulnerable people, for younger viewers, Victor says 13 Reasons Why could have a negative impact. But he thinks that if watched in the right context, with the right support, 13 Reasons Why could be an effective learning tool. It is almost that you can tell the stories, but then the stories have to be unpacked. You know, so this is why we've consistently been telling uh, parents and young people, if you're making the choice to watch it, uh, watch it with an adult, watch it with a parent, and, you know, really talk about what you're seeing. Of course, that conversation with adults, with parents, it isn't necessarily a given. But this show in particular has drawn intense scrutiny and conversation. People are talking about it. Parents, teachers, school administrators, and healthcare professionals are concerned about its messaging. Victor sees this as an opportunity. You know, I think we all learn about feelings by, you know, reading stories, watching TV shows, but to make it really stick, it's great if you have an opportunity to discuss and understand what you've seen. When 13 Reasons Why first came out, Victor wrote a blog post explaining what viewers should consider when watching the series. And the Jed Foundation and SAVE, short for Suicide Awareness Voices of America, responded quickly, distributing their talking points on the show. Netflix released a companion video in which the actors and healthcare professionals discussed depression, bullying, and sexual assault. Schools across the country sent letters home, alerting parents to the show, and teens spoke out on social media about its usefulness. This kind of response, Victor says, is key, and it's something built into the way we consume other kinds of art, where scenarios on the page or the stage can be analyzed and debated in the classroom or around the dinner table with others in a healthy, constructive way. The wonderful thing about art and drama and things like that, we're doing it at a safe, typically at a safe distance. You know, we're doing it one step removed from ourselves. Um, I think that's why uh, art and drama and things like that are are such wonderful ways to teach kids to, you know, unpacking that stuff, you know, reading Shakespeare and and understanding what's motivating the characters and, you know, how they're resolving the, the situations and decisions that they're making are great ways to learn about mental health. Of course, a show on Netflix isn't part of the typical lesson plan. Unless you're working with a foundation that specializes in preventing teen suicide, chances are you don't have a place in the curriculum to address depictions of suicide in film or television. 13 Reasons Why is different from other portrayals of depression, bullying, and suicide in teen-targeted shows because the entire series is explicitly about teen suicide and the events that can lead up to it or be blamed for it.
because the show depicts extremes, and because so many young people watch the show on their own, online, without a parent or other adult there to talk through those extremes with them, it has the capacity to trigger young people at risk. Now, if that triggering means that a young person reaches out and seeks help because something seems clearer to them after they've watched the show, that's ultimately positive, right? What about the kids who don't look for the safe space after they watch something traumatic? I spoke with someone who anticipated that need, someone who's made a film also very much about bullying, depression, and suicide, but the intentions of his project are a lot clearer. We wanted this film to be experienced in a community. We didn't want someone to just watch it on their iPad. This is Aaron Christopher. His film is called Listen, but you can't find it on Netflix or Amazon. Actually, for now, you can't watch it online at all. Because I feel like what, the way I grew up is that when you watched a piece of content, uh, you had the ability to discuss it because you were watching it with your family. Usually one, only one TV in the house. So everybody's watching at the same time, and, and that's where people were asking questions like, why did they do this? Or what does that mean? And my parents would explain it to me or my older brother would explain it to me. And, and then I did the same for my sister. And nowadays, you, you know, with the access to bandwidth and technology and all of these um, content venues, you know, you come home and everybody can go in a separate room and watch a different show on a different channel on a different device. And there is no discussion. Aram's been making teen-centric movies for most of his career as a director, aiming to understand young people and to make them feel they're understood, that somebody is paying attention. So when he released his latest film, Listen, he wanted to build a listening exercise into the experience of watching the movie. So he decided to keep Listen out of theaters for a full year. I had this idea, like, instead of just trying to go the traditional route, let's let's make this film accessible because we believe that it actually had the ability to have a tremendous impact and we wanted to find out if it could. Aram and his team made Listen available for free. The only catch? Every venue had to facilitate a half-hour discussion after the screening and they had to collect survey data. We wanted to basically connect the entire community on these, on these issues and it's in that conversation that you understand where the person's mental health is and how they're really doing. And that's where we can actually get the support that the person needs. The film Listen follows the intersecting lives of high school teens after a school shooting in a nearby district. From the beginning of the film, we see a snapshot of all of these characters. And at its core, in every one of these scenes, you see how individuals are not being listened to. It's not about them feeling heard. It's about them feeling paid attention to. Aram based the characters on the kids he's met over a decade plus of making educational films about teen issues, from bullying and school violence to body image and self-harm. It highlights what happens when a youth joins a gang. It highlights what happens when a youth gets pressured by a coach to be perfect and by their parents to be perfect. And what happens when this counselor tries to basically hold it all together? It's important to note here, Listen isn't so different from 13 Reasons Why in terms of entertainment value or drama. It too is full of emotionally charged scenes and good looking young actors. And it too suffers from some of the same pitfalls, oversimplifying and stereotyping, demonizing adults, and the potential for re-traumatizing the most vulnerable. The, the reaction of the film was extremely positive and, and powerful. And then during the active listening training, I had a student that wanted to talk to me, and I thought she was participating in the training. But it turns out that she didn't want to stay for the training, and, and she just wanted to tell me how she felt about the film. And this was a, a young girl who had actually dealt with some of the issues that the film had focused on, and she had a very strong reaction to the film. Um, she actually told me that she hated the film because of the fact that it, it got her to think about some of these issues again that she was trying to, to avoid, um, specifically depression and suicide.
But while many of the same criticisms of 13 Reasons Why could be leveled at Listen, concerns about contagion, romanticizing, laying blame, sending the message that adults are incompetent, that suicide is on the table as an option, the big difference is in the way Listen is being shown as an educational tool complete with a curriculum and training workbook to help guide discussion and learning, screened at high schools, universities, health organizations, and community centers across the country. We need to exhaust all, all uh, avenues of reaching these youth. And for people to be afraid of one manner of, of sparking this conversation, uh, it, it really baffles me. Aram acknowledges he's gotten pushback. Often this comes after administrators or parents watch the film themselves and decide it isn't appropriate for young viewers. After one of the first pre-pre-screenings of the film for school staff, a colleague of Aram's asked for feedback. And the administrator told her that he was deeply offended by the way the education administrators were portrayed in the film. He said he would never show this in his uh, school district. It's ironic that, you know, they're afraid to have a conversation about something that's already, you know, really um, has unfolded at the very school. And I honestly believe that that is the problem today. But cinema verite, direct, dramatic, and authentic, isn't the only way to tell stories and spur conversations. Heather Channel is not your everyday suicide. She was very popular. Come on, Paul. If I let these kids out before lunch, the switchboard would light up like a Christmas tree. I must say I was impressed to see that she made proper use of the word myriad in her suicide note. Heather's came out in 1989. It's a cult favorite, a dark, tongue-in-cheek movie complete with a cruel high school clique, multiple homicides, and a sharp commentary on how high schools and students think about suicide. It's the kind of movie that director Michael Lehman says couldn't be made today without getting a lot of people angry, because Heather's isn't sensitive. It's a satire. We were satirizing the fact that the institutional perception of what happened was actually completely different than what happened, and that in a certain way, what ended up happening was that the suicide was being glorified, or the alleged suicide was being glorified, and that the person who, who died was suddenly transformed into a completely different person than the person she was. In Heather's, the main character is disgusted by the school's response to multiple suicide. But she's also a self-obsessed teenager, blaming herself for the deaths while scribbling in her diary a bottle of vodka at her side. The most popular people in school are dead. Everybody's sad, but it's a weird kind of sad. Suicide gave Heather depth, Kurt a soul, Ram a brain. I don't know what it's given me, but I've got no control over myself when I'm with JD. Are we going to prom or to hell? The school counselor sees his student suicide as her kumbaya moment, an opportunity to have vague conversations about feelings, in particular, disingenuous feelings about those who died. And Michael says he wanted to highlight that kind of sensationalizing and how useless it was in the face of real trauma. There was no actual insight into what this person might have been going through. Uh, it was simply an exercise. You know, let's, let's talk about how it makes us feel. Uh, so we were saying basically it was empty on the part of the teacher, even though the teacher's intentions were perfectly good. In case you haven't picked up on it yet, Heather's is meant to be funny. You can't help but laugh at the absurdity of the situations, which means that this is a comedy about teen suicide which might seem totally counterintuitive, if not totally inappropriate. But that's not how Michael Lehman sees it. For him, that's one of the best ways to broach really difficult topics. Partly because humor is therapeutic, and partly because humor allows us to look at things that would otherwise make us way too uncomfortable to discuss, and also because humor tends to break down problems and turn them into It unveils the irony in problems and allows us to get a different perspective on them. When Heathers came out, Michael says, teenage suicide was already part of the collective conscious. It was all over the news, being talked about with labels and explanations, Michael says, that just didn't seem appropriate. And there were dramas about teen suicide at the time, too. And Michael says some were good. But satire, he says, can broaden discussion of uncomfortable, off-limits topics. 
those absurd situations and characters and Heather's, Michael says they're doing the work of exposing underlying problems, inconsistencies, fundamental ironies. And you can open people's eyes to, to aspects of situations that otherwise a serious approach wouldn't allow them to see because the ironies were, would be too hard to process somehow. You know, they tend to people, when they do something that's more directly dramatic or, or a documentary, they want to try to explain everything. And a satire doesn't necessarily have the obligation to explain. It simply has the obligation to show where things don't fit in a way that makes us happily uncomfortable. Michael says he's shown Heathers to modern-day high school students. And the harsh but funny scenes of bullying and high school bureaucracy and death, he says that kids get it and connect to it. They see behavior that's consistent with what's happening in their schools every day, which Michael says can help them process their worlds in a clearer way. A really important part of satire, Michael says, especially satire about a subject like suicide, is that you don't make fun of the victim. You don't laugh at a kid in trouble. The point is to depict that trouble without having it hit too close to home in such a way that a young person, especially a victim, can gain some perspective on their own situation. You know, you don't want to be making fun of the victims because these, obviously, the victims are really victims in these cases, you know. But if you want to be, you might be able to allow the people who would otherwise be depressed or victimized or singled out and you know, suffer from the way people perceive them, you might be able to help them get some insight into their own situation and get detachment enough to not become a complete victim. Michael says that film and television are great places to tackle serious issues because that's where many people get a piece of their moral compass these days. And also, you know, get a sense of how people should be treated who are going through things that may be different than, than what each of us is experiencing. But Michael acknowledges that his approach to these tough issues, satire, is harder and harder to make happen. Part of that, he says, is that the real world is growing increasingly absurd in a way that's difficult to make fun of. But, he says, he still falls back on satire as the best way to expose taboo subjects, the best way to start honest, open conversations. But the other barrier to making that happen, well, that's Hollywood. Hollywood loves to talk a game about responsibility and moral responsibility, and I think most of that is complete bullshit because, you know, when you go into the meetings that involved in trying to get a project made, um, it's pretty much commerce, you know, and and artists are always struggling in Hollywood. It's a classic story. You know, the artists are struggling to figure out how to get their, their voice through and how to make a point somehow uh, and have it fit into the into the world of commerce. So you've got to collaborate with the mercenary side of the business to get a project made. But that does end up raising questions about moral responsibility. 13 Reasons Why may start a conversation, but it takes some effort, and in the meantime, it's a glossy, addictive TV show. And Listen has its intended impact in the confines of Aram's educational screenings. But what happens to that movie after it's released and hits the big and small screen when the viewing experience can't be controlled. There's another form of entertainment that might be a way to skirt these questions of moral responsibility. It's a lot lighter and definitely shies away from the heavy dramatics. Really last? Tired of lipsticks that smear and fade away? Introducing Trauma, a new line of lip color from Project You Are Okay. Trauma is built to last for days, weeks, even years. You think it's gone? No way. This Ridiculous is a commercial, a fake one, obviously, in the style of Saturday Night Live ad parodies. It's by an organization that calls itself Project You Are Okay. This is the founder, Jenny Jaffe. So Project You Are Okay creates digital content for teens and young adults who are struggling with mental illness by adults or slightly older peers who have been there before. You Are Okay isn't all fake ads, and it doesn't tie itself to comedy either, although sarcasm does play a big role in a lot of the content. The point of You Are Okay is to normalize mental health and social issues for young people, 
to be blunt about really hard things, to say, yes, this sucks, and it's okay to admit that. There's a pressure to have things appear all good. Nobody is really talking about anything that's wrong uh, with themselves or with their families. And I think that the kids sort of key into that and they think, okay, so we're pretending nothing's wrong, so I'm not going to tell anybody if anything is wrong with me. And then they don't end up seeking help. Jenny is a writer, actress, and comedian. And she taps into her connections to others in the biz, actors and directors and other comedians, to shed some light on just how common mental health struggles can be and how possible it is to survive them. My first real sort of battle with mental health issues um, was when I was um, probably around 10 years old, and that was the first time I can remember being suicidal. My name is Mara Wilson. I am a writer, performer, and storyteller. I wish somebody had told me that it's okay to be anxious um, and that, you know, people, it's okay to be depressed and also, it's not a romantic thing. My name is Will Wheaton. I am an actor, writer, and producer. I wasn't aware of how my mental illness was affecting me until I'd been suffering from it for easily 15 or 20 years. Jenny decided to found You Are Okay when she realized that a platform like this, where people share their struggles with mental health for teens and do it in a direct, lighthearted, informative way, didn't really exist. She wanted to create a place where a young person could find someone who represented their story. And she felt that she had the responsibility, as someone who grew up with mental health issues and a really good support system, to create a support system for people who didn't have one. Because there's no one type of person who struggles with mental health issues, and no one reason either. All I know is that I was basically, I was born anxious. I, the OCD stuff, it's like, there's no external place I got that from. So I, I had a case of OCD so textbook. I'm literally going to be featured in a textbook about OCD that's coming out. Jenny brings voices in and provides lots of resources on the site. But she also leaves space for Project You Are OK users to post their own videos to contribute to the unique community that they're a part of. I'll have panic attacks. I have panic attacks on more than a weekly basis. But at the same time... I know that I'm not alone in that. And I know that I'm not broken. I know that I'm doing the best I can. And in that sense, I'm okay. And then in that sense, you are okay. Jaffe grew up in a California suburb that was so troubled by teen suicide, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention actually conducted an investigation into the area. But she says, sometimes a study can't tell you exactly what's going on because Jenny she didn't experience common pressures that might lead to suicidality, but she still had the feelings, the thoughts. And then I think the community response is to be like, well, the reason that there's so much suicide is because there's so much academic pressure and there's so much stress. And I think that that's a factor, but I was deeply suicidal growing up in that part of uh, the country. And I don't remember the academic pressure at all. I don't remember that. Like, I don't, I never felt stressed about school stuff. I just, I had a mental illness. And I think that that's scarier for parents to think about um, than the idea that there is some external factor causing these feelings. The Project You Are Okay videos combine a little of the seriousness, the blunt talk about depression, anxiety, fear, bullying, suicidal ideation, that you see in shows like 13 Reasons Why and movies like Listen, with the one-step-removed approach of movies like Heather's. It acknowledges that mental health problems are absurd in a way. They're so difficult to pin down, to define, to treat, to prevent. But that doesn't mean that having them makes you or your mental health absurd. Jenny, like the others I spoke to for this episode, is creating content that sparks conversation. She just cut out the middleman, her content is the conversation. The thing about Project You're OK is that the only thing we, any of us ever have to go on is our own experience, which is why all we can do is tell our own stories and help other people do the same.
So many of the conversations in this miniseries have had to do with responsibility, the right or wrong way to talk about mental health with young people. And it's important to recognize that we're having that conversation because we're at a turning point in the way that we discuss and address mental health in teens and young adults. Our youth are in the midst of a crisis, but it isn't going unnoticed. We're responding from every angle, parents, teachers, doctors, nonprofits, academics, artists, even teens themselves are looking for ways to talk about depression and anxiety, about identity, about academic and social pressure, about suicide, to help those at risk. As we continue to troubleshoot, to look for the best way to keep adolescents safe for our youth, we've got to keep the conversation going. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This is In Sickness and in Health. You can learn more about 13 Reasons Why and some useful ways to watch it by going to jedfoundation.org. That's J-E-D foundation.org. You can find information about Aaron Christopher's film, Listen, and his outreach work by going to listenthemovie.com. Jenny Jaffe's Project You Are OK can be found at projecturok.org. That's the word project, followed by the letters urok.org. If someone you know is in crisis or thinking of hurting themselves, do not leave them alone. Remove any firearms, alcohol, drugs, or sharp objects that could be used in a suicide attempt. Take them to an emergency room or seek help from a medical or mental health professional. Call the U.S. National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-TALK. That's 800-273-8255. Or text the crisis text line at 741-741. Another resource for LGBTQ youth is the Trevor Project's Lifeline at 866-488-7386. If you like what you've heard and would like to learn more about this podcast, or if you'd like to support the making of more episodes of In Sickness and In Health, please check out our website, insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. That's insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. And please don't forget to rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. Today's episode of In Sickness and In Health was produced by Hannah McCarthy and me. Our theme music is by Alan Best. 